So Ryan, obviously it's been a long time since we caught up, but for anyone who doesn't know you, tell us a little bit about who Ryan Anderson is. So, um, yes, my name is Ryan Anderson. I have been in the fitness industry for almost a decade now. Um, started off as a personal trainer around nine years ago. Um, worked my way up slowly from being somebody who's probably, um, you know how the personal training qualifications go, right? You, you, you don't really have to be a competent trainer to be a personal trainer. Um, as everybody does, um, we slowly worked our way, our way up. I think I was, I've been self-employed since the start of the journey. So um, I had to jump straight in into the business end of things and just learn on the way. It took me around five, probably about, no, I would say four or five years for me to get a solid client base, which was earning me a really good amount of money. Um, and then once I had that personal training business, I think a year later, I got a offer from uh, UP. So I started moving into, uh, so I moved into London, the big city where I thought I could perfect my personal training um, service. Uh, so that was good, a great learning opportunity, as you probably know, I really developed as a trainer there. Then I was there for around three, maybe three years, I think it was. Years, that flew by quick. Yeah, like I, look back, I look back now and I just realize how time flew by. But um, time, time flies when you're having fun, eh? <laughs> um, it, was a, it was a great experience. I learned a lot uh, in all areas of life. It was so good moving into London and just experiencing all of it. Um, so I was there for three years. We then moved to online coaching. Uh, simply because I think online coaching is just a better way, uh, the way forward, right? Uh, more earning potential, more flexibility. It allows me to help my clients like from wherever I am, regardless of if I'm able to be in, be with them one-on-one -on -one, um, and uh, move on to an, move to an online company. Uh, learned the ropes. I had a really good time there as well. Um, and yeah, then up until recently in the last three, two, three months, I moved fully online. So I, um, so as you know, uh, UP and the online coaching company that I was working for are all based around making hardworking professionals or helping hardworking professionals get into the shape of their life. Um, that was more so focused on, focused on in the online coaching company that I work for. Um, because the personal training company we worked for was great for getting people in shape, but it wasn't really focused on making people stay in shape, right? It was probably just getting them there and then kicking them out the door. So since then, my work's heavily focused on trying to make a service which helps clients get in shape, but stay in shape in the same time. And um, yeah, in the last couple of months since I've been going all alone, it's been uh, great to kind of make the service my own. And it's, it's good to use the knowledge that I've learned to create my own package to help the clients get the result that they want. So it's been a whirlwind, loads of ups and downs, but you know what? It's been absolutely fantastic. I think, I think going into you talking about like UP in a way, like helping people get in shape, but often not stay in shape, but not to necessarily throw too much shape because I, I do plenty of that on this podcast. But the, um, I, th I think one of the positives that will come out of this, and, I, and I've seen this already with the industry and I've, I've been very blessed with the network I have, that so many coaches are now coming in with this dissatisfaction of seeing people rever you know, reverse on a diet and gaining weight back and becoming more miserable and coming up with these issues. And I think this... this, this this will create a, a wave of momentum of people that can really get in people in shape for life. I, I know Nathan's doing it. I've got a big focus on what I do and you've got the same with your business. I, I do think there's, you know, like I, I can't remember where I heard this, but it's like, we don't have a weight loss problem in, in, you know, in the Western world, we have a weight management problem. And I think, I think there was definitely more people than ever equipped to sort of like, you know, go, go about that. You mentioned the start of this about coming into the personal, coming out of your personal training qualifications, which don't really pay for anything, um, and into the world of personal training and having to 
jump into the business stuff as well. Like, how do you find that transition? Because I know for me, I got in wanting to help people and get in shape and I like my training. I didn't even think about being a business owner. And like, how was that sort of journey developed for you? Like, how do you find leaping into that? Um, well, first of all, I think I was just ignorant to what it actually takes to have a business which you can live off. Live off. Um, and it was, I was a bit overwhelmed at first. However, it did spur on more growth because when you haven't got money coming in or when you're in a position like that, it just forces you to grow more. But um, I, I'm not going to lie, it was very difficult because... You, you become a personal trainer because you obviously want to help people get in the best shape of their lives, right? Um, but at that time, especially when I was starting and I was just opened with my own business, uh, it kind of, the difficulties made it harder for me to love the job that I was doing because it was just causing so much stress in my life. Um, but like I said, it was just a case of making sure that I... I invested more time into focusing on how to get my business, get improve my service, um, get my business going to a point where I can just at least stress less and do a good job, most of all, right? Mm. Because if you do a good job with any of your clients, then business slowly starts to get better, doesn't it? So I mean, I've had I've had a lot of obviously coaches on 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 the sh on the show, and yeah. like it's. It's very interesting when you see so many people talk about that, but coming into early business, being overwhelmed by the, you know, the financial side of it and, and, and struggling. And you mentioned it yourself about being stressed. And I, I remember, I remember days of, you know, getting up at 4am to do a class, having a big gap in the middle of the day, not making any money, walking treadmills to finish at nine, go and do nightclub promotion, finish that on the weekends, go and become a butler in the buff for Saturday and Sunday to make my ends meet. Right. And like having to do runners and taxis when you hit your overdraft limit and stuff like that. And I'm always really fascinated in what I think is a very, very difficult industry. What makes people push through that? Because there's so many people that drop off from personal training and just can't handle that. What is it that you think that made you stick the course and like keep pushing through even, even when it was really tough? To be honest, I think it's just passion for what you do. Uh, I mean, I've got so much from training. I used to be a skinny kid that was fairly uncomfortable with myself, um, loads of anxiety, and I just didn't wait, like the way that I looked. And it definitely affected myself and how I just, and how everything was in the world for me, I think, to a certain level. And um, I knew the benefits of training. I loved the benefits of training. I wanted to help other people see that benefit from um, improving their body shape and their health. And I just couldn't imagine doing anything else. I mean, I've had a few other jobs in my past where I was just literally, I think it was stacking shelves and doing, just doing things like that. And I know that's not the only job opportunities out there. However, it made me realize that I've done jobs that I flipping hate and I life sucks. Now I need to make sure that I have a job where I am absolutely passionate and I want to wake up every day and be happy with what I'm doing. But I've done one end of the spectrum and I wanted to make sure that the rest of my life was spent doing something that I absolutely love to do. Mm. Uh, so that was it for me. It just, it was no, no question. There was no plan B really. I think, I think that that's a common trend. And I, I it certainly was like that for me. Like I, 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 there was times where I was at crossroads in my career. I was like, do I continue down this route? Do I, you know, continue this? But it was, it was so like, I always looked at that scenario and I was like, this would be a total last resort. Mm. And that alone said to me, it's like, I don't want to do this. It's just me being uncomfortable and I can sort of push through that discomfort. And there's always something that comes out, comes out the other end. And I think the great thing about the, the, the personal training job, whether you're doing it remotely or whether you're doing it in person, is, is being able to connect with people from all sorts of different walks of life, whether it's other coaches or whether it's, clients and like I even even at times where you know our former employer got as toxic as humanly possible I I kind of like I my day-to-day -day was so much fun especially in that basement in Shoreditch that's like yeah. how many other people really enjoy coming and doing the job like mm -hmm. putting aside the career the happy where they're at but actually just 
going in in a day and enjoying the job. And I was like, that even if I'm not where I'd want to be at that time, it's such a unique career. Yeah. I think it has such an impact. And I think well, more of an impact coming through the, this pandemic. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, yeah, there, obviously I love online coaching, what I'm currently doing now. Um, and I am happier than I was doing personal training. But one of the biggest pluses for personal training was definitely working with a team, um, just seeing, connecting with people one-to-one and just that, yeah, just that whole, that whole team, that whole team aspect of just going in, everybody on the same vibe, good vibes. Yeah, I, I really miss that. I really miss that. Other than the obvious of like actually being on the gym floor, do you find the coaching process different working online now entirely um, to when you were doing it one-to-one? Or was it like the similar thing, but you just don't do the training bit? No, I think there are... <laughs> I think there are differences to what I do from what I do now to what I did do, but I don't think there has to be. So when it comes to personal training, a lot of the focus is generally on that one training session or the hour that you're with them. Now, of course, we're supposed to, we're the leading personal trainers in the industry. We don't just train them for the hour and we do focus on their nutrition and their activity. However, that's, not as that's not in the forefront especially not as the training itself a lot of focus is on the training um whereas with coaches now we're kind of like someone mentioned it to me the other day uh, one of my clients it was like you're literally like a health consult consultant because you're managing all aspects of their life like the amount of water they drink the the food they eat uh, when they do their steps you're managing their diary and it's a lot more um, a, a holistic approach to helping them change their physiques. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I've, I've always said it's like personal training, one-to-one, -one, it's like, it's the micro, but online coaching is often the macro in, in the sense of like, yes, we do look at the bigger picture in terms of how that, you know, long-term program and things like this, but you've got people that come in, they'll have, a, you know, they're, they're there just to train. They might've been out till 2 a.m. They might've had a stressful day at the office. They might've had a bad night's sleep and you're always pulling things on the fly. And while you still sort of do that with online coaching, because you're looking at a week's worth of data, you can start to go, this is where I want you to be in six months, a year. You can start to put things in place to help their life long-term. I, th I generally think you're going away, going down the route of this industry where this can potentially have a bigger impact. I think, one-to-one -one is great to get people started, but I do think there's potentially more scope, not just for coaches to be able to earn more and give, you know, but to actually, for clients to actually have a better experience. Yeah, I, yeah, I definitely agree. I think the industry has just developed more and more. We're becoming more conscious of what clients need and actually want. And we're slowly adjusting and creating the right service to make sure that they're not just doing it for, a, for an A to B plan just to get there. We're making sure that they get there uh, the best way possible. Their health is uh, prioritized and they keep these results for the rest of their life. So yeah, it's the de yeah, the industry is definitely growing and getting wiser to this. How do you feel that like, you know, in, in your journey of transitioning, because you transitioned from the one-to-one -to, -one to online during lockdown, right? Yeah. Was, was there an element of you were, was it a bit of a forced into it and then you were like, oh, I kind of enjoy this? Or was this always the plan and you decided to take the leap in the most uncertain time possible? What made you take the leap during that time? No, so I always I always thought about doing online coaching. It always been it always was in the back of my mind, simply just because of the the benefits that you don't get with personal training. Uh, like I said, personal training is great, however, long term. Uh, getting up at five in the morning, staying in the gym till 9 p.m. and just all of that, it, it can't last long term. And especially when you want to, I, I don't know, improve your, develop your career, like settle down with, a, with your partner, have a family. You can't be on the gym floor till, for those crazy hours. So I always knew that one-to-one -one PT was not going to be the end or be all and I'd have to adapt. And with that i just said with online coaching is probably the way forward for me uh, yeah it will suck that i won't be able to have a team around me etc but um better earning potential more flexibility um i'm able to 
help my clients regardless of our locations. I'm able to help more people potentially, which is amazing. Um, so just weighing out their weighing out their pros and cons, it was the way forward for me. And during the first lockdown, I was still personal training, but I was still doing Zoom calls, so one-to-one -one Zoom calls, which worked out pretty well. However, because I knew the next lockdown was coming and I didn't know how many lockdowns were coming after, I was like, all right, maybe this is a sign that this is not going to be the long-term solution for my career. So it's time to move on. I, I, I would have tried to sack off as many of those Zoom calls as possible. I, <laughs> I, I'm sorry for end. Like, no one contact me if they want Zoom personal training because I hate it. And I like and it, I, I don't think I was that bad at it, but I just, I, I'm, I'm in this, I mean, I've been in this world where for so many years in high-end gyms where everything has been so optimal that me trying to create a split squat challenge where the camera cuts off the head and their feet. And I'm just like, so I've just seen the middle, never, never again. Can't, I couldn't fucking stand it. Um, I'm lucky here in Hong Kong that when lockdowns happen, we could still go out and train people in the park. It wasn't a full house lockdown. Um, oh but even so, imagine doing that in 40 degree heat. Uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised. I thought you would uh, like that. Only because when it comes to your, obviously when it comes to all areas of your coaching, you're very intricate and you, you, uh, you know all the details to literally everything. I thought um, coaching people one-to-one -one via Zoom, you could be very specific in all your execution. Um, yeah, all of, all of your execution protocols. I thought you'd like that. Yeah, but I'd like I'd much rather do that in a chest press than with two water bottles on the floor. <laughs> like, yeah, that's I mean, true. Like that's the, true. The, the amount of workouts I saw, people putting things in a backpack, I'm just like, oh Jesus fucking Christ! Yeah. Like, go yeah. for a run. Like the 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 big thing I found with lockdown is the reason why like gym equipment was, was the most purchased thing ever. It mm. collected more dust than ever before, and I think there's a lot of that is down to like people trying to do like something that resembles their workouts in the gym at home with a one kilo dumbbell. And I'm like, if you could bench press 80 kilos for eight, doing 400 reps of floor presses isn't going to feel, isn't going to satisfy you. Like do something else, improve your mobility, improve your stability, improve your conditioning. You know, like what can you do properly at home rather than what can you half ass at home? Yeah, it did get ridiculous. I remember, I don't know who it was, but I saw a personal trainer online on, a, on an Instagram story training their client and they were doing bicep curls with a can of baked beans. It was, uh, I was just I, like, what is the, the best, point? The best one I ever saw. And it's a, this is a shout out to someone you'll obviously know very well, uh, a Ryan Chua. And for anyone oh. who doesn't know Ryan, Definitely just go, just give him a follow on Instagram and give some, give some support to Ryan. He, he, he's the most mental, high energy human being you'll ever meet in your life. And the, the, the Scottish phrase would be a few sticks short of a bundle. And I remember him doing one of these UP Instagram live workouts where he was doing it with a um, bottle of detergent. And I come on, he goes, it's Simon, he's from London, he's from Hong Kong. And he comes up and he just goes to the camera and just lifts the lid and then carries on with his workout. I was like, what is this? Oh my God, that guy is, uh, there's no one like Ryan Chua, man. What a character. And I'll tell you what though, no one, I, I bet Steve still trains at City. Yeah, man, yeah. Like, like you said, he's a, he's a crazy one. But he was he was he was a good trainer, man, and he made his clients feel like royalty when they came into the gym. Because he said the name four hundred times now, like he's great. Yeah, he yeah. read this book of like saying someone's name will make them like you more, and then it's like, "Hey, Steve, how you doing, Steve? What's up, Steve?" Tell me good. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, it's a great interlude for the podcast. That anyone doesn't know Ryan, but believe me. It's, it's, it's in your best interest to go and sign this man. I, if I, I hope that he gets a, a blue tick in a week by all the people that listen to this. Yeah. <laughs> go and follow yeah. Ryan. Um, so, but how did you, going into back onto the, sort of like the transition online, how did you find it affected your own training? Because I can see this going one of two ways. Either 
you're sat behind a desk more, you're more sedentary. Or it could be more like, well, I'm not as stressed. I, I, my recovery is better, so my training results are improved. Like, how do you find your training going? Yeah, like you just mentioned, it could go either way, really. Um, but I think one of the things that I speak about with my clients, and one thing that we get, we make sure we do, especially since the clients are, are very busy people, they're working maybe 10 hours per day, is like the importance of time management and making sure that you're making time for your non-negotiables. And I've got to be honest, when I first went on to online coaching, I kind of was just like, oh yeah, I, I'm like, I'll get this done whenever, I'll wake up whenever, and I'll get this all done. But that like that affects the amount of the amount of you could do. And my training did suffer for that. So initially my training did suffer, like I mentioned, but then it was just a case of just practicing what I preach because the online coaching company that I worked for, there was much heavily on planning, structure, uh, just being disciplined, stay, like keep with your non-negotiables. Um, and I, it was just about practicing what I preach, making sure I do the same. And if you think about it, you've got 16 hours in a day if you're sleeping for eight. And if you've got them designated to certain things, then I think the majority of people will be able to find ways to get everything done. Uh, especially, especially me. I'm you, like you're, we're dealing with clients who are who own companies, are managers, very busy. And whilst I whilst it, we are busy as online coaches, I think we definitely have time to get the training in, get our nutrition in, um, as long as we uh, plan around it. So. I think it's important for everybody, right? As you're saying, like. I've, I've worked with you, you would assume that these crazy you know big ceos are i've got this crazy amazing diary management to fit all the stuff they do in and you realize when you start working with them they're just as chaotic as us mm -hmm. and you know I, I i i still work with people where like it always comes back to that it's like have you blocked this in your diary and you know this is this is something where maybe the advantage is in the one-to-one the -one game is because you do that by default so like people come in, they've blocked in Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 12 or 7 because they're going to see you. Whereas now they don't just do that. And like your business, it's like, well, I'll do some check-ins and I'll do a bit of study. And then it pushes back an hour and it pushes back an hour. And then by four, you know, it's 8 p.m. And these things never get done. And I suppose until you break that pattern, you know, and this is what potentially the job of the coach is, to break that pattern and go, no, you've got to put this in, otherwise it just won't happen. This is a trend that will repeat. Yeah. 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 That's a yeah, go on, sorry. No, no, come on. What were you going to say? No, I was just going to say that's uh, the biggest bottleneck for most people is just creating structure. And there, there's going to be some resistance there at first, but it's kind of like, you don't know, you've just got to be logical, right? You've just got to be like, just explain to them, like, this is how it's been for you. And this is why you probably are at the place you are now. If we're going to move forward and you are going to get out of the position and move towards your goals, then it's just a case. This is just going to make things so much easier. And it's, it's, it's making them understand that you can't avoid resistance as well, right? There's something mm. I, you know, I've watched recently in one of these very, very overly well-produced YouTube videos um, talking about like, like any new skill, like having a bit of resistance is going to be like, because you were so used to just doing nothing. You're so used to putting your feet up and watching Netflix, that's your go-to. But like every time you do something, that resistance turns into excitement. That becomes a little bit easier and a little bit easier and a little bit easier. So it just becomes the way of doing things. I think a lot of people sort of go like, Ex like are coming into a certainly into a coaching process going i'm going to be motivated to train now and i'm like no one's motivated to train all the time personal mm. trainers aren't motivated to train all the time like mm. just having like understanding that i have a bit of resistance but i'm gonna do it anyway because this is important i always compare it to like going to work right obviously we're in a very privileged position of what we do but like all of our clients will still go to work and i'm sure a lot of them would rather stay in bed but they don't yes. they go to work because the putting you know a nice food on the table going on holiday buying a rolex is more important than get you know lying in bed that morning and it, yeah. it's exactly the same thing when it comes to getting in shape yeah that's the exact same metaphor i use to my clients is like you probably don't feel like going to work every day but how would your how would your income look if you just went when you was motivated mm. yeah and, so yeah. we like obviously you mentioned the the you know, going into a little bit of structure and obviously we talk about diary non-negotiables things like this and you know a little bit of in terms of what your your old company did but also a little bit of you saying that you want to set the foundation for long term what's mm -hmm. your kind of things you kind of work on with people early on 
to set themselves up for something that could be potentially a long-term result? Well, first of, all, first of all, I just kind of see where they're at, where their current structure is and where their lack of structure is, sorry, and kind of see where their goals are or what they want to achieve and kind of find a midpoint to where they yeah, kind of find the easiest possible way they can transition from where they are now to some form of structure. So whether they are, so when it comes to nutrition, it's just, a, it's just about getting the basics and making sure we get breakfast, lunch, dinner in. When it comes to the actual meals itself, it's just a case of making sure we get a protein source in all of your meals, carbohydrates in certain meals like around your training and fats in these meals. Um, same with uh, things like steps as well. It's, what I do first when it comes to making sure we lay the foundations for the, the, the their sorry, lots of words. When it, when it comes down to laying the foundations for their transformational success, it's just a case of setting, setting some targets, laying a foundation and assessing, and how, assessing how it goes and then adjusting as we go along. So for example, they, need, they know they need to do 10K steps a day. They know that they need to have 1500 calories a day and I kind of create a diary so they can achieve all of these non-negotiables. And then their, their job is to carry out these non-negotiables as best as they can, and then see how they go along the way and just make adjustments. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I say it's, it's, I think it's, it's winning the day, right? I think that's, that's, a, that's a, it's, it's a lot, what a lot you're trying, you know, you're doing with your guys to sort of like get into the point where they, if the, each day is better than the previous day, those days will eventually add up into something, something pretty big. Um, but yeah. So like going into a little bit about, you know, the kind of people like you work with and also a little bit about your own training, you, you know, one thing that some people know, some people might not know about you is that, you know, you are a plant-based eater. So like, how did this start for you? Like, how did you like go down this route and how have you found that's helped, hindered, you know, your training career? So I watched the Game Changers, Game Changers Netflix show. And then I'd I love to hear your opinion on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but scarily enough, that's where most people get their nutrition, uh, the, their nutrition facts from, which is, a, which is a shame. Not to bash the vegan diet, of course, but I think if you're getting your information regarding nutrition around a Netflix documentary, you're not getting the most credible information and research but um the way i transitioned into plant-based eating is firstly because my brother went plant-based he was a heavy meat eater ate meat all the time and um, the same with all of us in the family but he transitioned into a vegan diet straight away just from researching animal agriculture how they're treated etc so his decision to be vegan was mainly around being ethical and just causing no harm to animals. Uh, then my mum started reading into it. Um, then she transitioned into there. And being in a house with vegans, like you are, like it rubs off on you, right? Um, the, yeah, so they, um, so I would, I would continue to have meat, but every time I had certain meats or certain foods, uh, I'd get the odd comment. My mum was like, oh, I don't like that smell anymore. So I was like, all right, cool. Uh, let me look into this stuff and see what you're talking about. And then it just happened like that. And then it was just, yeah, it was just, I understood why people became vegan. And when I researched about animal agriculture, it, it was like horrifying, especially when you see like the worst parts of it and how some of these animals are treated. Uh, I'm a very loving guy. I love all life, especially animals. So I thought, you know what? It doesn't make sense for me to eat uh, meat if I don't agree of how it's made. Mm. What was your um, original diet like when you made that switch over? Because obviously this is, I'm assuming, pre-personal trainer, bodybuilding training sort of sort of life, I presume? No, I was actually a few years in. So mm. three or four years in. Um, so my diet was fairly good, uh, as good as it was going to be back then. But I was still basing my nutrition around my training. I was eating a good amount of protein, of course, through the meats and eggs. 
uh, still getting in vegetables, like eating three meals a day, protein shakes, etc. So it was a fairly easy transition into the vegan diet because all I did was continue eating the same carbohydrates and fats and protein shakes, but it was just a case of switching my chicken into corn or tofu or something like that, uh, or Linda McCartney. Mm. And to be honest, that solid foundation from actual my previous diet when I was eating meat made it easier for me to just transition because it was just a case of swap, I like for like swap. Do you think it would have been a, like harder for you to transition earlier on, like pre the personal training days? One, because maybe you didn't have the tissue to, to have a good amount of food to be able to have the flexibility with it, or because you, did, you wouldn't have gone into it with the same sort of diet structure. Do you feel like having a structured routine with meal plans helped make that transition quite simple? Yeah, 100%. I, yeah, I definitely, I think I'm one of the people who, who have a better transition into the a vegan diet. And I think that obviously there are pluses and you can be just as healthy and grow just as much as on a vegan diet. But if you go into a vegan diet, not really being aware of the possible nutrient deficiencies, then your health and your progress could be hindered for sure. So with people, obviously, like you maybe listen to this who maybe are plant-based or considering going plant-based, what are some of the things that the, someone needs to bear in mind when in terms of wanting to optimize their health on a vegan diet? What are the, like, whether it's the nutrition deficiencies or things you need to think of, what are the big things you'd look at? Uh, when it comes to health, I would say, I would say there are, so there are definitely nutrients which are more present in animals that, that, obviously they don't get on the vegan diet. So they definitely do need to prioritize getting these nutrients from other sources. Uh, one of the main ones being vitamin B12, which is present in obviously uh, meat-based products. Um, Omega-3s, which is uh, present in, which are obviously present in fish. Uh, things like iron, uh, calcium, um, Things Great. like carnitine. There's, there's, there's a few. There's a few that people are not really aware of. But like I said, if you are aware of them and you can, you can just get these, these nutrients from other places. But um, an important thing to note is that with these micronutrients, it's difficult for your body to digest. Then they, they're more difficult to digest from plant sources than they are from. Uh, animal-based sources in most cases so um it's so yeah it, it does get a bit tricky however there are things that you can do to make sure that they are just as efficient so when we're going into some of the some of the solutions for people i mean like the first the big thing that people often talk about is, is struggling to get a lack of protein in. you sort of mentioned like switching up to corn and you know yeah. and McCartney stuff and that sort of thing um I suppose the two biggest issues that people tend to arise is like one is is how do you bring those proteins up without bringing everything else up with it? You know, your residuals, your carbs, your excess fats, and ramping the calories up. And, yeah. and then I suppose the other thing is when you're looking at like amino acid profiles, you want to get really nerdy. You see, leucine being the big thing driving protein synthesis. Getting your essential amino acids in is tricky as, as a vegan diet, right? Because you almost have to combine things. Does it sometimes become a bit of a math thing? It's like if I do this and this. To, I get everything or is it quite easy to using things like protein powders and that? Is it quite easy? Yeah, it, it depends where you are on the spectrum. I mean, loads of people who are vegan are very health conscious. So they try and limit the amount of processed foods that they have. So if someone's going in the vegan diet, prioritizing health, in my experience anyway, I see that most people tend not to include a lot of soy products or corn or you know the man-made meats and things like that but these kind of products like tofu like any soy product uh, linda mccartney corn they tend to have a really good profile in regards to all of the essential amino acids um so you can just do just as well just by replacing them however if you're going for like trying to be a complete I don't know, natural foods with your vegan diet. So just getting in lentils, beans, etc., rice. Yeah, one thing is that you obviously, if you have enough of these foods to get your protein up, you're going to have a lot of a lot more carbohydrates and fats in your diet. So it is more difficult. 
But um, I would say if that is your aim with a vegan diet to be as whole foods as possible, then you do have to be a bit more diligent to get the get your protein from varied sources. Mm. Uh, for example, beans and a rice separately don't give you a full spectrum, but together you can get a full spectrum of amino acids. Um, so trying to get your proteins in different sources throughout the day is going to be essential. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned something very interesting in that about um, that a lot of people going into a vegan or plant-based diet tend to not want to consume too much in the way of processed foods. Mm. Do you think that's a lot of the reasons why you, you see, like if it's, when the game changers came out, so you mentioned that earlier on, yeah. there was a lot of a push towards this research of the vegan diet is optimal for human health and it cures all these diseases and things like this. Do you mm. think that's some of the reasons, I'm not saying the studies are necessarily flawed, there's the truth in everything, but do you think yeah. that's like, the, the, when studies say, people who go on a vegan diet tend to be healthier. Do you think there's a lot of it's more down to the fact that most of them cut out a lot of processed foods rather than necessarily they've gone plant-based? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, and I know a lot of vegans are probably not going to like me hearing this, but whilst I do think, yeah, you can be just as healthy on a normal diet than you can with a vegan diet. Um, I do think if you're not going into the vegan diet, like knowing what to eat or knowing what to include your your health could be hindered and i don't think a vegan diet is necessarily good for health i think that most people who are conscious of their diet and make the decision to go vegan are those same people who are just more conscious about their health uh, and are more likely to exercise more or be more mindful and stress less and things like that which contribute to their yeah better health yeah, and like, if you look at the people that go vegan because they don't like me, it's very a small percentage. Most of them have very similar backstories to you, you know, in yeah. the sense of, unless they've watched the game changes and the, turn the life around. But, you know, if, it, if it's animal rights, they're, more, they're obviously going to be more mindful. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have gone down that wormhole and researched all this stuff anyway. So, mm -hmm. like, there's, there's obviously going to be a knock-on effect. And I think when looking, I think it's interesting touching on the game changes because... Obviously, you mentioned obviously that's not the best source of getting where your where your information comes from. And what was your reaction to watching that? Like truthful reaction rather than the one we gave at the start. Um, to be honest, when I watched it, I was pretty convinced. I was convinced. I think if I didn't come, I'd, I think if I didn't watch it from a background of kind of knowing nutrition or just um, just being wary of. What, go, what contributes to good health, I would have watched that and been like, wow, the vegan diet is the way forward. And I was a bit like, oh, there are some plus sides to it. But then the, after I got, when I, when I didn't get as excited <laughs> and I thought about it, I just, I, I, I kind of knew that you could be, I, it was just all hype, right? It was, it was a documentary aimed at making the diet look good. And the main benefits of the vegan diet in that documentary was mainly around limiting um, unhealthy meats or animal-based products and eating a lot of vegetables, which you could do in either diet, right? Doesn't, you don't necessarily have to be vegan, but you can reduce processed meats and get good, better quality meats um, yeah, on a normal diet. I think the word process, the, the, the term process means really interesting because I hear, I hear this a lot. Like um, the process term is almost thrown in there almost mm. to try and make you believe another argument. And in this case, in like terms of like, you know, in terms of the plant-based stuff. But I remember this in terms of the, the anti-red meat argument. Like, do you remember that time I was on the BBC and they came into UP and did some filming with me and Tom? Yeah. And yeah. I remember this and I was, it, it, they came in and they, they looked at my, like you came into my house and asked me how much red meat eat a day, it, you know, and it was like dramatically more than the week's average. And they did this thing in the butchers where they opened the, the, the you know, one of those big sort of banquet lids. And it was like, here's what you should eat. It's like half a steak per week. And then here's what you eat. It's mountains high. And, mm. and a lot of the, everything that this, I'm going to put in air quotes, dietitian, so she ends up listening to this, was talking about. And it's not her fault. She's, she's, she's got the information from the government guidelines, right? And it's, there is a correlation between heart disease risk or whatever else, 
between people who have high intakes of red and processed meat. And the two mm. things I often find one with that is one, correlation and causation. But, mm. all, but two is how can you put those things in together? Like how can you compare a grass-fed steak to a piece of corned beef? Yeah. Like if you took yeah. the process out of that, if you just looked at high quality red meat alone, would you get the same findings? Yeah, probably, probably not. Yeah. Probably not. So what's your, what's your, like, your advice? If someone's, if someone ends up coming to you on online coaching, they've, they've, they've heard about your story of being a fan base, to go, oh, I want someone that understands this. I'm thinking about going into it. Um, and they've seen the game changes. Mm-hmm. And that's their rationale. What would your advice be to them? Uh, my first... My first thing I would say is what are their reasons for being vegan or wanting to go plant-based? Because if it is purely on health, they, 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 they fear for their health. If they stay, uh, continue eating meat or animal based products, I would honestly uh, just enlighten them and let them know, okay, game changes is probably not the best way to get your facts from. Um, but I'd also tell them, however, if you just generally want to go vegan because there are other reasons, maybe it's ethical reasons, then yeah, I'd, I'd happily put you through the process, kind of teach you how to optimize your diet to improve your health. So um, yeah, I think I'd come at, come with it from that angle. So if that was someone's thing, like how would you get like let, let's say I wanted to go vegan tomorrow, I don't, but um, how would you how would you start? How would you get someone started out like the easiest? way possible to transition into that um it depends right where are they at in their where are they at with their current diet um because like i said in both diets in both despite how you're eating or what kind of diet you're following you can have a good healthy diet so if they're already coming from a place where they are eating plenty of nutritious foods it would just be a case of making sure they're covering their bases and making sure they um are able to include the foods in their vegan diet, which get them the nutrients that they do from their previous diet. Um, one thing that I'm going to be doing soon to all clients who come in is asking them to get a blood test. Mm. I think that's the best way to best way to kind of gauge where they're at, because you can tell you can tell people. Um, sorry if you can hear the dogs barking. That's all right, don't worry. <laughs> Because you can start shoving loads of supplements to them and being like, take this, take this, take this, take this. But if you're not really sure where they're at, you don't really know if you're overdoing it, if you're even under, underdoing it when you're like providing the supplements. Uh, it's going to be the best gauge to get blood work and see where they're at exactly. Yeah, and then- I always think with B12 as well, you just mentioned you know, being deficient B12 potentially on a plant-based yeah. diet. I've known people that have massive genetic differences looking at blood work in B vitamins. And like, I know people that are, eat tons of, of, of red meat and have naturally low levels of B12 and B vitamins and have to have shots. So like, there's such a genetic component to that that you could like go, oh, they're plant-based. They need this, 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 and this. And they might not. And it might just be a waste of money for them. I think I, I, especially in the UK, like it's so, like with many checks, it's so easy for your clients to get blood work. Nah, yeah. there's no real reason not to. No, I agree. I agree. You might as well. So, like, an interesting thing I wanted to sort of get your take on. So, obviously, we spoke about a little bit about the pros and cons of um, plant-based eating. Um, and the first thing I wanted to talk about is, like, how does, like, you went over, because you did um, your photo. What was your photo last for the photo shoot that you did? Um, I think it was around two years ago now. Course. again time's flown right but yeah you yeah. were ridiculously good and you held a lot of tissue which is you know it's not necessarily something you often see when people diet with plant you got some but like mm. what did your diet particularly change going into that shoot prep were there more challenges doing this plant-based um you know how did you find the actual post of getting in really good shape using this yeah so um there was definitely, I did have to make massive changes from the start of my diet to the end of my diet. Uh, from the start of my diet, when the calories are fairly high, um, I could include more foods, which I'd ideally like. So I'd have less processed meat and um, yeah, I'd have less processed meat, more variety when it comes to my food. But as I dieted down and I obviously had to reduce the 
calories. Um, it was difficult for me to include the, the foods that I wanted to include, but have fairly low protein, but high carbohydrates. Because obviously as the ratio goes down and my calories go lower, it's difficult to include them. So towards the end of my diet, I was focusing, I was relying, relying on uh, the soy based meats or the, the mock meats as they call them the tofus and things like that, and the protein shakes, just to make sure my protein stayed high and my carbohydrates and fats stayed low. Um, so that, that was the biggest transition. That was the biggest change. And I knew that it didn't really bode well for me because I think I was compromising my health to a certain extent. It's not the end of the world, but it was only going to be four weeks. And if I had to just eat corn four times a day, with um, loads of vegetables and a little bit of fats, then that was fine. That was fine for me. And, and, and protein shakes, of course. I had to, I had to uh, drink a lot of those. <laughs> do you, do you, is this something you let like people who are going fat-based know when they've been embarking on a diet that they're potentially going to have more, maybe more restrictions on their food than maybe somebody else because they've already restricted their food quite considerably and now we're about to go into a deficit. Is that something you, you make sure you inform people early on because before they get a bit of a surprise that they can't have all the foods they used to like? Yeah, I think that's, um, I do tell them, I do let them know, but I think once we've discussed their diet when they first sign on and they kind of understand nutrition to a certain extent, that they kind of know what's expected when the calories are going to be dropped because they're fully aware of the protein sources, which are high protein and low carbohydrates. And they're aware that the proteins that are fairly low protein, but high carbohydrates are going to be difficult to keep in the diet when their calories are low, especially when they see the protein stay high, carbs go lower, carbs go lower, carbs go lower. I think they kind of expect it, but, yeah. um, I, I do obviously make sure I, I do check in, make sure how they feel and obviously let them know of, let them know the transition of, okay, we're going to have to start including more of these foods, uh, more of these foods you don't necessarily like to eat. Uh, we, we are going to have to rely more on protein shakes, which will affect your hunger a bit because they're not going to be as satiating as eating your foods. But um yeah, I make sure they they know as much as they need to beforehand, but they kind of have an idea anyway. I suppose one of the biggest concerns a lot of guys face when going into these sort of fake meats and soy sort of based products is that mm. old myth about um, soy affecting some of these testosterone levels. Now, do, do yeah. you find there's any truth in that for someone that's obviously eaten soy? Had a lot of people eating soy quite considerably. Do you, have you noticed anything in those sort of ways, like any symptoms or blood work changes or anything like that? No, I haven't. I haven't. And not definitely not with my clients, not with myself either. And this is actually something I looked up at, I looked up on as well in the research. And it's very mixed results. And it's difficult to conclude that uh, more soy equals more estrogen. Uh, it, it's just, it's difficult to conclude. And I think that something which it depends on who it's, who it's been done, uh, who it is as well, because everybody has different gut microbiome and everybody reacts to soy differently so how it works for one person doesn't necessarily mean it means it's going to happen for another person so yeah i would say when it comes to soy products don't depend on them have one or two portions a day but i wouldn't be too scared don't think that every time you're going to have tofu you're going to start milking from the tits <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 and that's the first sign of low testosterone by the way you know is when you get into your 40s it happens to all of us so just just be aware of that <laughs> um, i mean like one of the things i sort of want to close on is obviously you know the vegan trend came in and it's sort of like yeah. sort of like like everything everything's cyclical and we sort of like the vegan trend sort of like getting a bit quieter now and in its place is the complete opposite and i wanted to see mm. what your take was on the rise of the carnivore diet and what you thought of the carnivore diet, the pros, the cons, um, because obviously that's so completely different to what you've done in yourself or often with some of your yeah. clients. Right, I'm going to be really vegan here. Just to define what the carnivore diet is, just literally meat and vegetables, right? Not even that, not even that. So the, oh. a lot of people who go and talk about the carnivore diet, you know Jordan Peterson? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've saw, it, seen a video on this guy. He's 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 a big carnivore guy for years, and he's it's um his daughter's done it with some. She has some crazy autoimmune conditions that that really cleared up on the carnivore diet, and the aim being that you're basically consuming lots of um meats in particular red meats and organ meats because organ meats will get your the nutrients that you're probably lacking from your um vegetables um no veg literally it's just meat meat bit of salt um and with the, with the aim is that you're cutting out things like soluble fiber that could you know affect your intestinal permeability and a lot of people are saying they feel better the gut issues clear up and all that sort of stuff um but yeah, I mean, like, again, obviously, this is obviously relatively new to, to yourself, but on, on initial glance, what was your initial thought process of, of that sort of approach be? Well, initially, because I'm so health conscious anyway, and assume that vegetables and a variance of vegetables is an essential part of being healthy, I would say that it doesn't sound like the most optimal diet to improve health. But from what you're saying, that loads of people are getting benefits from it. So I think it's just a case of, if it works for people, it works for people. That's the ultimate thing. If it works for them and they're happy doing, doing it, then go for it. If you do the carnival diet and you're just doing it because of the trend and you're trying to force it, even though you are feeling negative from it, then it probably doesn't work for you. But um, I'll be interested to see how that, to see the studies behind that, if there is, um, actually see how people react for it. Have you tried it? So I have I I've, I've not tried it for any length of time. Um, I've I've like Joe Rogan quite famously did thirty days of carnivore diet, and apparently you like pretty much shit yourself for the first week um, because it's basically just like they, 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 people say it's they're clearing up the gut. I just think it's you take all the fiber out your diet, you're gonna shit through the eye of a needle. Um, but like he said, he felt tons better after that really horrible first couple of days, um, mm. and you know I so. I, I think I don't know. My 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 mind isn't made up necessarily on it. I think my thought process is like I can see the benefits of it. it's basically an extreme elimination diet. Yeah, and a lot of people do can get messed up with fiber if they have really severe gut issues, and it's like it's like when you talk about um, every Netflix documentary that talks about the keto diet and how it helps kids with Alzheimer's and helps people survive cancer and things like this. There's a lot of these parasites just feed off sugar. So cutting out carbohydrates and low carbohydrate diets is like putting a plaster on a gut dysfunction. It doesn't necessarily solve it. It just temporarily, they don't like you go on a diet, you, your neat starts going down. You don't move as much. Imagine this is what your gut bacteria are doing. You don't feed them as much. All of a sudden they just start like, you know, being a bit more dormant. Then all of a sudden you throw back in all those foods again after a while. Um, so I think it's, I think it can have benefit in the short term. This is just my take on it. But then I think it's like over a while you have to work on how you're going to reintroduce some of this stuff back in. Um, mm. You know, like probably starting with sort of like almost, you heard of Stan Efferding? No. So Stan Efferding, um, well worth looking up. He, he wrote a diet called The Vertical Diet, which I, I like yeah. much more. Like The Vertical Diet is probably like, if you're going to go into something like the carnivore diet, this is probably like stop here before going full on carnivore. Like it's, yeah. it's basically red meat. He's got, he's basically said he's got vertical axis. The essential food is basically red meat and rice. And then he's got yeah. your foods on a horizontal axis, which are all your vitamins and minerals. So it's, probably, it's not as much fiber. It's like spinach, it's oranges, a bit of fruit and like lots of salt. And like, that is like, I would say if someone has any issues, got issues, like start there and add carbohydrates back in and laying them back on top um, before going full on but i know it's, it's big here in hong kong there's a lot of people i know in, in big personal training companies that are big preaching the 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 carnival diet really yeah like i haven't heard of it until i moved here you what sorry i hadn't heard of it until i moved here but i think there's there's a lot of short-term studies but nothing long-term which i think is the biggest concern mm, yeah it'll be interesting to see to, um to see what happens long term to people on this diet is, is there much in a way because obviously like obviously there's tons of research on omnivore diets for decades and obviously there's considerably more research on vegan diets um than there is carnivore diets but like is that from what you've seen is there is there much data on sort of long term really long term vegan diets and how they impact health positively or negatively um to be honest i haven't looked much into the long-term effects of vegan diets 
but from what I from what I see and from what I from what I hear, I, I think there's no there's no big health impacts when it comes to vegan diets, as long as you are covering your bases and making sure that you you're getting all the correct nutrients in your diet. And I think ultimately that's what it comes down to. I think that any negatives that come with a uh, vegan diet mainly comes down from a lack of B12 with most people who, who, who suffer with a vegan diet, but it always comes down to a fact that they're not getting in something which they potentially could do. Mm. So yeah, no, I think you long-term, you're going to be just as fine on the vegan diet as long as you're, you're covering your bases. I generally, I generally think it's to so see you hit the nail on the head. It's, 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 it's down to making sure you're, you're, if you're going on a diet, you're, you know, you're calorie deficient, but not nutrient deficient and whatever approach mm. works for you preference wise, because like when it comes to studies of anything, as this is there's a take home message, probably it's this, like whether it's for pro vegan, pro carnivore, pro keto, pro omnivore, like it's so difficult to get reliable data on any sort of diet and study because you're relying on one so many variables. Someone's mm. sleep, someone's recovery, someone's stress. How many people actually follow it? How many people track their intake accurately? We all know from online coaching how like the yeah. biggest problem is people don't track the food properly. You know, and these are yeah. people that don't have a goal. Like your clients have a goal. It's it's people have been told to for, for a study to take out the foods they love for six weeks. Yeah. Um, that like you know, it's, it's like Luke Lehman always used to say, it's like probably the healthiest diet you could think of is you take a really really good high quality vegan diet and you stick a steak on top of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. I agree yeah. with that. And yeah. I thought, yeah, that, yeah, that's brilliant. And then if, if you take one of those things out, like anything else, she's like, what do I replace it? Hmm. Mm. Yeah. so obviously i don't want to necessarily keep you all day you're say a busy man now with you know all your online coaching clients so for anybody who wants to know more about yourself your diet your training your coaching where do people find Ryan? um so go and check me out on my instagram everything's done through my instagram now since i'm being uh, since i'm online i'm an online coach um i have just forgot my instagram handle for a second <laughs> but it, it is ryan anderson tc um, yeah, any questions regarding a vegan diet and how to improve your um, improve your training goals if you are following a vegan diet, then hit me up. More than happy to help. Um, but yeah, thanks for getting me on, Sai. It's been a, it's been a pleasure. Yeah, mate. Yeah, it's, it's been really it's really good for chatting to you. And I say I'll I'll put the your Instagram handle just in case anyone else forgets it in the show notes. Um, and you know, and I would definitely vouch for this guy in terms of a vegan diet. I've seen you get vegans in shape. I've seen you get yourself in phenomenal shape and I've got a few vegans in shape, but I've not, you know, I've, I've not done it as consistently as you have. So definitely if that's your preferred way of eating, this is a better man to speak to than me. Um, that. All right, man. Good, good chat to you. And I'll chat to you soon.